So my title is Democratizing App Creation, which is a kind of a big picture concern. And I just want to start with the setting the stage with the big picture before I dive into more specific stuff about what I've been working on lately. Um, the, the title is Democratizing App Creation because this is related to like what I think is the biggest problem we as technologists could be working on in the world right now, which is that software is it's eating the world, right? It's famously going into everything. It's famously mediating all kinds of social relationships. More and more stuff runs software. And if you're somebody who writes software, you are this part of this cast of magicians who have this power to affect the world now in a way you couldn't before, right? Writing software is very much like the archetype for magic. You just know the right incantation and real things happen in the real world. And the more every device has a processor and the more every relationship is mediated through software, the more our magic spreads. Right? And so it's a superpower. Uh, but like any superpower, there comes a point in the story where you ask, are we going to use our superpowers for good or for evil? And the way I approach that question is, it kind of depends who's the we we're talking about. Who gets to write software? Who gets to be creative with software and wield software to you know, put their voice out in the world, uh, support their point of view? So democratizing the creation of software is a kind of important question to me. I, I think we don't really get to have a kind of free, flat, equal world if software runs everything and only a tiny amount of people can make software. So that's setting the stage for uh, this talk. Now Drupal is a success story in this area. Right? Drupal actually is very uh, successful at democratizing the access to making websites. People who could have not made a website without Drupal can make a website and that's an extremely powerful thing. And there's a huge continuum there of, you know, somebody who, people being able to do things they couldn't do before because of better tooling and also people being able to learn things they wouldn't have been able to learn before because they get to be part of a community that's open to developers and themers and site builders and everybody, right? That's a really powerful pattern and that's why, um, that's why I like being part of the Drupal community. That's why I like learning from all the experience here. Um, so at the same time, the, the web platform, right, mostly driven by the kind of explosion in how good the, uh, the JavaScript engines are and how good uh, the browser APIs are, has really taken off as an application runtime, right? So it's now possible to write the kind of things that you used to write as a desktop app or, or maybe as a native mobile app, right, all on the web. And that's a hugely important development, right? If you're an advocate of openness, of free software, of open source, um, it's a very exciting thing. This was a dream for a long time to have a universal runtime for software that could actually, uh, that was not, not controlled by any vendor, could run on basically every device there is, right, and yet be a full, powerful, Turing complete, complete, nice to work in application development environment, right? We have finally reached the point where JavaScript can do those things and that's very powerful. Um, so, but of course there's a, uh, that's still hard to do. There's a lot of organizations who could use a Drupal today who would still struggle to, to ship an app written entirely in JavaScript, right? It's still harder to do. So I want to talk about the continuum between smaller, simpler applications or libraries or frameworks and bigger, more complicated ones that have more features. Any practical application has to do a lot of things, huge amount of things. If you stop and think for a second about authentication and authorization and rendering and storing data and getting that data back and third-party integrations and templating and schemas and it goes on and on and on. Validations, constraints, right? These are all things that almost every practical application is going to need. Um, and it's a giant pile, right? So if you start on the left end of this curve, which is where most new technologies have to start because they're simple and it takes a long time to grow more features, um, there's a big gap between a practical application and what you get out of the box, right? So if we think about a couple projects, I'm putting Drupal far on the right here because Drupal's actually got a lot of features. All those things I talked about are things you get with Drupal and Drupal's ecosystem. And, and I'm definitely talking here about whole ecosystems, not just like core projects, right? So if you've got Drupal, Drupal is big and complicated and it has a huge amount of features and, ha and therefore it has a broad user base, right? 
it does a lot out of the box, and that's hugely powerful. That gets us, connects to our story about who gets to write software, who gets to contribute, lots of people, because it does so much. Right? More features is generally better. Like, there's not really an argument. More features is better. It's just a question of how much they cost, and they take time to make, time to make it well. If we think about some of Drupal's kind of cousins in the open source world, a WordPress or a Joomla, they're basically out in that same kind of end of the curve, of the way I'm looking at it, same end of the continuum. Maybe they're a little bit less complex, maybe they're a little bit less features, um, but they're all kind of close together in the scheme we're talking about here. So then we look at JavaScript land, right? I've dropped in here React far on the left. React is very popular because it's easy to adopt because it's small and simple. But if you think about the gap between what React does and what you need for your practical application, it's a vast gap, right? And so the teams that are successfully shipping apps on React are investing massively in their software. Right? It's not an accident that React came out of Facebook, right? Not everybody can develop software the same way Facebook can. Um, if we move up, and, a lot, and there's a huge, huge ecosystem now of kind of React likes that are basically the same scale, and they kind of fight over who gets to be the furthest left, because they all brag about how tiny they are, and, and you know, React is too big and bloated, you should be using Preact or whatever. Um, they're kind of all fight over that left end of the, of the continuum. All right, moving up to more features, a little more, com more features, more complexity, we get to something like Angular. It does a lot more out of the box than React. It is a whole framework, it has opinions. All right. Moving a little further, we get to Ember. Ember is what I know best. That's the community I come out of. Um, among the JavaScript frameworks, we've long been the most opinionated with the most features and therefore the most complexity. Um, but there's still quite a gap between what, an Ember gives, what Ember gives you out of the box and what, say, WordPress gives you out of the box, right? Um, I mean, one obvious thing is, like, there's no database. There's no server. There's nothing standard like that. You have a front-end framework, and figuring out all the rest and how it relates to a server is all up to you. That's a pretty big gap, and so that is a, that's a problem because there's a reason people are using these JavaScript frameworks, right? We, getting back to the story about f the rich runtime that the web is, to take full advantage of the modern web platform, we do want to use these things. We do want sophisticated JavaScript applications. So, but if we're going to allow a broad audience of people to write those kind of applications, we need to close that gap. Right. Um, I'll also throw in a plug here for Glimmer, which is uh, extracted from Ember. It's Ember's low-level templating library, uh, which is now published and usable as a separate package. It's basically at the same level as a React. So you get, get to start small and adopt gradually all the pieces of Ember. So we have a pretty good story all the way up from the very small up to pretty ambitious applications at the Ember point. But we don't, up until now, have a good story for going all the way from Ember to, say, WordPress or Drupal. So I want to talk about work I'm doing now to try to get us there. So today I'm talking about the card stack application framework. Um, and you'll notice uh, I've got a whole bunch of things in that box above card stack. And I'll, I'm going to go into more detail about why that is. But I left them there because the point is that uh, card stack is opinionated about servers, but it is not, uh, it is not, uh, doesn't want to be your only server. It's all about integrations. And integrating with Drupal is an important, one, an important example. So the goal is to have a smooth continuum process where if you start at the very small, you could start with Glimmer, which is a small, fast, focused UI kind of, if you just want to make a JavaScript widget, it's a great choice for that. You gradually add capabilities by installing more packages all the way up to full Ember application. And from there, somebody who was already experienced with an Ember application could install packages until they're up to the full card stack experience which is much more of an out-of-the-box experience where we want to approach the kind of broad-based access that Drupal already has. So the kind of driving principles behind what we're doing with Cardstack. The first is that we embrace HTML. And this is, uh, it's, when you say it that way, it sounds uncontroversial and everybody likes H and like HTML is obviously what makes the web go around. Of course we need to embrace HTML. Um, but it's actually a fairly strong opinionated stance, especially when you look across the, the, the universe of ways people write JavaScript apps. Um, I think it's actually really critical that the way you interact with components in, in Ember or Glimmer or Cardstack is in a language that is very consciously, very consciously designed to be HTML plus a little bit. 
which is very different from saying it's just JavaScript, because JavaScript is a massive universe of semantics. And so if you look at, if you contrast that with uh, writing everything as pure JavaScript, writing it as, J or, writing, or writing it as JSX and transforming that into JavaScript, right, you actually, you suck a huge amount of semantics in that way, which means you don't get as much static analysis, and you can't, and most critically, you can't help users as much. Um, and I can give some examples of that as we go further into the talk. Um, but basically, this is an example of the principle of least power, right? All of JavaScript as a templating language is actually more power than you need, and that's actually bad because it means you can't statically optimize them, you can't teach people to write them as well, they're harder to debug, all those things. Um, the second, second principle is that uh, Cardstack taps into the deep Ember add-on ecosystem. Uh, that's why it's built on Ember. And it's because in that earlier slide you saw Ember was kind of the furthest to, write, to the right among the JavaScript frameworks, the furthest toward the more standardization, more features set. Um, you, it turns out you need that, right? I think anybody who's worked with Drupal understands the importance of Drupal modules and understands the importance of API boundaries, pluggability, standardization. Um, you can't build something like Drupal without that. And you can't build something like Cardstack without that. So we needed a framework and a community that actually buys into the idea of standards. That's why it's all built on top of Ember. And lastly, the thing that's unique about the Cardstack architecture is that it coexists with the data sources you already have. And certainly for a Drupal audience, one of the most relevant examples of that is that um, it coexists very nicely with Drupal, right? So th this is important for a whole number of reasons, um, but most of, mostly it's because every practical application that's going to deliver a lot of value to people almost always needs access to some data that's already out there, right? Starting from a blank slate is a very rare thing. And a lot of times, even projects that do start from a blank slate, they do it because it was too hard to start from the data they had. So they kind of had to duplicate or throw away. And you see this across, especially across large organizations all the time. Um, there's, I have an example, I, I should have got a screenshot of it, of a login screen for a major bank with like nine different login buttons because they clearly acquired and built and accumulated many enterprise systems over the years and integrating is hard, right? So it's especially hard if you do it after the fact. So the goal here is to build an architecture that is all about integrating uh, from the beginning. So before I go into more detail on these points, I'm gonna show a quick screencast video demoing a little bit of the experience of what it feels like to edit using these tools in the card stack architecture. Um, I have some silly sample data here. I'm just moving through this kind of simple site. Um, when you, the, one, the couple of the things you'll notice as we go through this, the experience is really designed carefully around keeping people in sight. I, I, think, I think we all get why that's desirable. Uh, wow, this resolution is not good, huh? Oh well. Um, I'll have to sh share these videos in fully res after. The, um, it's also designed carefully around balancing structured content versus kind of inline WYSIWYG. This is not, this is not a freeform WYSIWYG experience. This is structured content, which is important. I think that's a core value to Drupal. It's a core value to Cardstack as well. Um, so what we're seeing I is context with structured content editing, and that's why we have these kind of toolbars that affect the experience. Um, so here we're, we're making some new content. We're adding, gonna add a picture of my son here with his crayons, right? We're gonna add some content. Now, um, this, is a, this is a rich text field backed by MobileDoc, really great format and libraries you should check out. It's cross framework, uh, JavaScript, vanilla, vanilla JavaScript supported. Um, we're gonna dive here quickly into the fact that content has many forms, and so the tile form of content is actually really important. This is the, or rather, card form, right? So we can preview the card form of this same piece of content, and we can go in and customize it. So here I am actually customizing the crop of our photo so that on the tile form, it's gonna look nice. Um, and we don't have to have just one kind of, one tile form. So here we're gonna customize how it looks at one by one. We're gonna go in and say, we actually wanna also support a two by one form of this content. And so you get one pretty good default result here. It seems good, we didn't need to customize that one too much. Now let's say we're also gonna support a hero image form of this content. And we're gonna customize a headline, and a, some link text. Um, 
And as I'm adding these formats to this piece of content, I'm basically approving it for use in those places. And so um, this talk, I don't really have scope to go into depth on kind of layout and search and all those things. I'll touch on them kind of briefly, but I think I'm at least illustrating the basic point that content has a lot of forms. Uh, it's really nice to be able to edit and preview them all in context. Okay. And then lastly, I'm just going to show here that we can go into our editorial controls, approve it for use on the home page, mark it published, hit save, and we'll find it back as our current uh, hero image on our home page. Uh, basically because like, this home page happens to be set up with the newest, newest content wins. So, um, so that's, that's to give you a taste of the uh, kind of experiences that we're building with these tools. Um, so what is the experience like of actually building out one of these sites? So I, men I mentioned that we're bullish on HTML and the, uh, that's a deliberate and conscious decision and I think that HTML is a, as long as, it, as long as something like a templating language is designed carefully and has really great tools around it, it's actually pretty broadly accessible. Um, and so in Cardstack today, the way you actually uh, determine the field order, for example, is literally by going to a template like this one and moving things around. Um, and so having good tooling support for that is the kind of thing we continue to invest in. Um, you can look at this template without knowing a lot about templates and get a pretty good intuitive sense of what this means if you've had a little, at least a little exposure to HTML. Um, and teaching is actually one of the core values here as well. The better the tooling is around this stuff, the better we can, the more people we can, re we can reach and the more, the more they can actually uh, interact on a smooth continuum from somebody who's an experienced developer to somebody who is, um, you know, just getting started as a developer to somebody who is just getting started with HTML and CSS to somebody who hasn't done any of this stuff. The goal is to make an, an environment where all those people can find a home and be productive, and th but be constantly interacting with people at other points in the continuum. That way, that gives everybody a chance to level up and learn. And the learning flows in both directions because even the grizzled developer learns an awful lot about how to make with their contributions uh, work for broader audiences when they have that interaction. Under the hood, when we sh see a template like this, um, this kind of thing passes through the uh, Glimmer compiler which is actually going to be able to tell you statically if you're doing certain things that aren't going to make sense. It's going to tell you statically if a tag's not closed. It's going to, ac it actually is a completely spec compliant HTML parser, so it'll even tell you that you really shouldn't put a div inside a span and things like that. Um, we know that, we know that content is special, which is why all of, in that demo you were seeing, the little blue boxes are drawn automatically around your content. Um, they're detected statically here in these templates. So. All the, all the author of that site needed to do was make something as simple as this. Um, now, one of the other nice things about HTML as a kind of lingua franca is there's really nice patterns for composing it. And that's not an accident, that's how HTML is designed. Um, but I want to take one example which it talks a little bit about um, plugins and pluggability and how that connects to theming in, in, in a componentized world. So, uh, I'm going to take the example of let's install a plugin to our, to our system here that is the Drupal auth authorization plugin. And uh, what it gives you is a, com is a component that you can drop into a template called Drupal login form. And it gives you other things too. It actually installs server side pieces that actually know how to speak to Drupal and do token exchange and all those things. Um, but when you install the plugin, the, the vision is you, in you install the plugin and what it shows you is actually this snippet, it's a, and th like sample. Here's what you paste into your site. Put this where you want the login box to be. Right now, that composes very freely with a whole host of other things. Um, but of course, like people care about being able to style their things. They care about customizing and reaching into something like a login form and making it look the way they want it to look and behave how they want it to behave. So a component like this one, um, if you just invoked it like this, you're going to get the default thing. It's going to have some default behavior, it's going to render a login form and it's going to know how to sp actually speak directly to the back end and authorize, authenticate you through Drupal. Um, but you can use it in a more expanded form and um, we, we typically call this block form uh, in Ember World because you're passing a block of template into your component. And in this case the component yields out usable things to you and in this case there are things, there's a 
form is, think of it as, lo as a local variable here, but it's got the username, password, and submit fields. What's nice about this is now uh, you get to put them where you want them. If you want them in a different order, you just reorder them here. If you want to add uh, classes to them, you do that. If you want to add other content interleaved with them, you can do that too. You just put it in here. And more importantly, if you're, uh, when you want to install a theme with a certain look and feel and layout behaviors, that theme is also just giving you components and they can compose as well. So in this example, if we wanted our submit to actually be using some fancy button that comes out of a theme package, right, we can expand again and use our form, uh, our submit component can actually, instead of rendering its own default layout, can be purely behavior. It gives us an action and we could now render a, something like a button uh, directly and compose them, right? So these kind of composition patterns are extremely powerful. Um, and my contention is that with good tooling, with good teaching and systems that are carefully designed, this is a fairly accessible experience. It, that's not to underestimate the teaching involved to get this over to the point where they feel comfortable with this kind of templating system. But it's a much broader set of people we can reach than if you say just like write an app in JavaScript, right? Um, some of the nice things here are that all the data flow, um, all the behavior can, is f basically fully static statically analyzable by the compiler. So we get to give people a lot of feedback. Um, so I want to touch briefly on, on the little, that some of the time I have here on like what is this architecture I'm talking about? How does this stuff work under the hood? Um, so I want to touch on the kind of server side pieces you need to do this kind of experience. So if we think about the continuum of complexity up from very simple JavaScript libraries to a framework like Ember, which is pretty comprehensive but all in the browser and has no opinions about the server, up to what we want to build here for Cardstack, um, it's clear that you need server-side pieces. Uh, something like that Drupal login form plugin I showed you earlier only really works if it also understands how to configure on the server side, like the enough cr the credentials it needs to speak to Drupal, the ability to do token exchange, that sort of thing. Um, so the way we do it is there is a server-side piece. We call it the Cardstack Hub. Uh, the critical thing to know about the Cardstack Hub is that it, it is not the canonical store for any data. So all of your data, whether that is content that users are editing, whether it's config, uh, whether it's the set of users and grants and all that stuff, schema definitions, all of it lives somewhere else. Uh, and that somewhere else, it's actually fairly agnostic about. So one of the backends we've implemented is a Git repo one. And that's actually a really nice pattern, especially on a brand new site that's getting going because your code is already in, in, in source control and your config really should be and making that a pleasant experience is really important. Um, but in a fast evolving site, it's often a really painful experience if uh, the folks working on content are in a completely different workflow. So by keeping all that content and config uh, all and along with your code all in a Git repo, that's a really powerful kind of backend. So when you use that backend, uh, people can basically uh, make changes on the site, save their content, and they are, they are behind the scenes making a trail of commits in Git on the branch that you want them to. Um, and we could even render the site under different branches, gives you really, really powerful options for workflow. Um, an SQL backend, right, just would let you plug directly into whatever existing databases you've got. Um, a super powerful way to access your, kind of your arbitrary enterprise custom stuff that you might need on a website. Um, a Drupal plugin, like, which, we've, uh, which we have, not fully open sourced yet in the repos I'm going to link you to, but we have it working and we'll be open sourcing all of it. Uh, this, it's powered by the JSON API module. Shout out to Mateu and, and all the folks and Wim and all the folks who've worked on that one. Uh, that makes this kind of plugin simple and nice to use. Um, and Lastly, I like marked legacy business systems because that is, that's working on a lot of advanced projects like that is partly why we uh, came to this hub architecture in the first place. It turns out organizations have a lot of, a lot of data sitting in a lot of places. They've got data warehouses, they've got users in Active Directory, they've got all kind, they've got customers in a CRM. And it's too painful to, to merge those things together, right? It becomes an expensive custom development process that puts it out of the reach of too many people and out of the reach of too many organizations. So it's very much in the theme of democratizing the creation of meaningful, ambitious applications that these things are now pluggable, right? The goal is that somebody can install a plugin that knows how to speak to Drupal 
put in the address of their Drupal and the credentials to speak to Drupal. And now they have, in their, in their new, new app they're building using Cardstack, they have full access to all that data. Um, it, it, it's completely first class. There's, because there's no database of its own in, in the hub, um, the data from Drupal or the data from Git, they're all equal citizens among the data. There's, it's not like uh, many of the integrations where that you would do in a, in, a, in a server that has its own database where the stuff that's not in that database is not really first class. Right? We don't have that problem. Now the way we solve, we, the way we pulled this off architecturally is that the hub is a fast uh, cache essentially of all this data. Uh, it uses Elasticsearch internally as its store, which can scale out to very big data sets and it could do very sophisticated searching on it. Um, and what that means is that you can implement these plugins like the Git plugin or the Drupal plugin and they don't have to be in the critical path. So we can index things at near real time or as fast as your indexer can go or as fast as your legacy data source can, do, can go. We index that all into the hub and then from, from the hub forward to your applications, we can serve it all out of fast cache. Um, and that also lets us standardize our query language because now apps can speak one standardized query language that knows how to query that cache. And so when you have a, a full text search or an interactive search plugin widget that you're adding to your site um, and you add a new backend, uh, all of that new content from that new backend is natively searchable. They are all, they're all interleaved, they're all just there together. So it's a powerful architecture um, and uh, we've been using it successfully in client apps and have been progressively open sourcing it. So this is the repo that holds most of the stuff I've been talking about, card stack, card stack. Um, it is, uh, this is, so you know, we're working in the open, this is 100% open source, this is not a product for sale. Uh, I believe strongly that we need this ecosystem to grow and it needs to be a legit community project. Um, we have, a, I have a bunch of contributors helping out. We've been extracting it from projects that we've done and uh, kind of codifying best practices and standardizing APIs as we go. Uh, so where we are today is this, is, this is new software. It is not a polished product that you can go read the docs, try it out. This is, we're really excited to, to hear from other folks who are doing this kind of work and want to join forces. Shipping an ambitious community project like this takes everybody. It takes a lot of, a lot of hands, and I, you know, Drupal itself is a testament to, to that whole process. This is not different. So to, to achieve all the things I'm talking about, um, we're on the hunt for more contributors and more folks who want to try it out, even though it's very new, and need to dive in and, and help us with it. Um, and also just organizations who think they can use this. If you've got a project that you can use this on. Um, come talk to me and we can figure out ways to uh, figure out where the current gaps are and what you would need and what we've already got and how to close them together. So, so the, that's the pitch. The pitch is let's, let's get a broader set of people empowered to actually ship really ambitious applications uh, on the open web platform uh, so that everybody gets to build great software. And that is all the time I have. So um, I'm going to stop there. and I gonna let uh, Taylor get set up so instead of taking questions live maybe actually maybe I can just come down while he gets all plugged in and uh, and then when he starts we can go and uh, folks can get me after the afterwards and we can uh, take questions offline thank you